Good morning and welcome Journey family and friends. Um, this morning I realized that there was just awesome, these couple of awesome words that were on the screen. It says, God is good all the time. Um, so that just kind of resonated within me. And that is why in the Psalm, uh, Psalm 100, the psalmist says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. We forget to sing sometimes. We go through the day and we totally forget. I know that I do, and I'm up here on this stage singing, but we forget. So just remember to sing today. Sing this morning and sing today because singing moves you into a different place, and it moves you to that place of um, joy and, and just knowing that God is good and into his presence. So that's very important. Um, so let's worship the Lord this morning. Let's stand where you are and just worship. Have you ever seen the wonder in the glimmer of her sun? As the eyes begin to open and the blindness meets the light. If you have so say, I see the world in light. I see the world in wonder, I see the world in life, bursting in living color, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. Have you ever seen the wonder in the air of second life? Having come out of the waters, with the old one left behind, so say, I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in life, bursting in living color, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. I see the world in grace, I see the world in gospel, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. Walking in the wonder, you're the wonder in the wild, turning wilderness to wonder. If you have so say, I see the world in love, I see the world in freedom, I see Jesus way, you're the wonder in the wild. Who am I that the highest king 
would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun says free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who oh, the Son sets free, oh, it's free. I need, and I think many of us are like me, we need Sunday morning. We need to start our, our, um, our new week with worship because we need to be reminded of who we are. We need to be reminded that we have a Heavenly Father who knows us and loves us and who is for us and has a plan and a purpose for our lives and is with us in the pursuit of that. We need to know that we are your children we need to know that we have a heavenly inheritance. We need Sunday morning to remind us again as we start a new week. And I pray that as we do that this morning, Lord, as we, as we worship and as we pray and as we attend to your word, Lord, that you would close the gap from the, the lies that we are so prone to believe about ourselves and the things that we profess to believe because of who you are and because of what you've done. Close that gap that we might begin this week a people who are fresh and alive with hope, with purpose, with direction, with confidence that we are known and that we are loved, that you are with us and that you are for us and that you have begun again work, a good work in us and you are going to bring it to completion. Lord, thank you for Sunday morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm uh, really glad to be with you this morning, uh, worshiping together. I try really, really hard um, not to ever use my, um, my position here and the opportunity that I have to speak uh, to people every Sunday for, for personal means. Um, but desperate times call for desperate, measure, desperate measures. And, and so, and, and actually, you, you have a vested interest. I need your help this morning, okay? I need your help. Every January, my parents come out um, to, um, to stay with us for a month, and they didn't come um, this January because of COVID. And my dad's my barber, right? My dad is fully vaccinated now. There is no reason that they cannot come. So if you would just please, if you would in the, the Facebook live feed there, if you would just, we're going to start a petition right here. Ralph and Pam, it's time to come to California. Your son desperately needs a haircut, right? Just please help me out with that, okay? And, and I think it would help you too. It would, it's got to be a distraction at this point. I actually watched last week's summer and it was a distraction to me. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome to the journey this morning. Um, there's a, a nautical term called kedging. And uh, the, 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 the practice of kedging is this, that if, a, if a, a ship or boat is going into a harbor, and either because of, of weather and, and conditions that, that are dangerous, or um, because the, the passage into the harbor is, is narrow, the practice of kedging is they will take an anchor from the ship and they will row it out in front of the ship into the harbor. And then they will use that anchor, they would draw it in to actually pull the ship into the harbor so they can get through either the dangerous passage that's narrow or tumultuous seas to get it safely into the harbor. Now, several weeks ago, we set our hearts on a pilgrimage from, from Psalm 84. Set our hearts on a pilgrimage till, till each of us appears before God in Zion. In, in, until each of us r- arrive in our heavenly home. And to say that what the passage that we're on is, is perilous w- would be an understatement. Right? We are moving out of dangerous waters through a difficult passage in pursuit of a heavenly home, and it is a hard way to go. And Jesus doesn't pull any punches about this. We looked at a passage last week. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. If you have a lot of trouble believing a lot of things Jesus says, that one's not hard to believe, right? In this world, you will have trouble. And if there was an anchor that you could carry forward and drop into heaven, drop into Zion, that would pull you safely through this life into your heavenly home, what would that anchor be? If there was such a thing that we could roll forward, drop into heaven, so that we can make our way through this life and get to our destination, what would that anchor be? What would catch us into heaven? Maybe service or, or prayer, loving our neighbor, going to church every Sunday, what would be the anchor? Jesus actually answers the question. And his answer, I think, is it's pretty surprising to me, and I suspect it might be to you as well. He he answers the question in Matthew chapter 6. It's uh, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what he says. Do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Eugene Peterson, in his message translation, says it this way. The place where your treasure is, is the place you'll have your heart set. The place where your treasure is, is the place where you will have your heart set. And if your heart is set on a pilgrimage that is taking you to Zion, into the presence of God, and 
we're moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. We talked about a few weeks ago. That it's the place, Eugene Peterson says, that we'll end up being. That Hebrews says that hope anchors the soul. But Jesus actually says, and when he talks about treasure, he makes it clear. We'll look at this in a second, but he makes it clear. He's talking about our money. He says, Hebrews, hope anchors the soul, but money anchors the heart. Even if you don't take Jesus' advice on investments, on where to put your money, don't dismiss the counsel out of hand and the effect that your investments have on your direction. And think about it. If you've spent everything you have, your lack, because of where you've put your money, the lack that you feel right now, is weighing your heart down. If, if you've spent money that you don't have, hoping that it would come in the future, Proverbs says that you are actually, your investment of money that you have spent that you don't have, that, that when we do that, that it, we actually become a servant to those that we borrow the money from. Money is the leading cause of stress, or one of the leading causes of stress, and the number one cause of feuds and fighting in marriage. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you put your money, your heart will be set. I found this out a number of years ago in a really significant way when I started realizing that the money that my employer was putting um, into my retirement account started to accumulate and was actually in this thing called the stock market. I never gave two cents about the stock market until I realized I had this money in them. And then I started watching it bounce around like a rubber ball. And it's like, what the heck? Hey, that's my, right? Now I care. I didn't really care that much about the housing market until I bought a house. And now every time one of those little realtor, form, realtor forums comes, the, the advertisements, and it has the list of all the houses in the neighborhood and sold and how much they're worth now, I look at it because it matters to me because that's where my investment is, where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. And pull no punches. Jesus doesn't. We're not, right? Money does matter. Money matters. Because Jesus says it is our number one rival to God. He goes on in this passage that I started with in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It says, you can't worship two gods. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship. And this is where he makes it clear that the treasure is not just, you know, our time or our talent. He says, you cannot worship God and money. You cannot worship God and money. Because so often what we look to money for, what we rely on money for, are the very things that God wants us to trust him for. For our security. Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 18, The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. The rich... Imagine their wealth to be an unscalable wall of safety. And the key word in there is imagine. The rich imagine that their wealth is an unscalable wall that will protect them. That protection is what God calls us to rely upon him for. We use money to try and control our world, to keep things managed, to keep things under our thumb. We use money for comfort, for security. Those are the things God says he desires us to pursue him for. James says that, that money is the fuel for so many of our ills, so many of the things that we struggle with, for selfishness, 
I want. For envy, I want what you have. For greed, I want more. From James chapter 4. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Money is the number one rival to God. Money matters. Money matters, but it is a lousy lover. Solomon says those who love money will never have enough. Right? If you've ever gotten a job, a new job, and the new job is going to come with a, an increase in salary and, and you're so happy because you're finally going to make what you're worth or at least more than you were making you before and it's going to solve so many of your problems, and, and two months later or three months later or six months later or a year later, you're right back where you were when you started before you got the raise. It's like, what happened? Those who love money, it will, there will never be enough. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, how, meaning, how meaningless to think that wealth will bring true happiness. And research and studies actually back this up. Once your basic needs are covered, food, shelter, your basic provisions, once those basic things that you need to stay alive are covered, more money can add a lot of things to your life, but research shows that it does not make people happier. The love of money, a lousy lover, because Paul says that the love of money, it's often misquoted, the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. It's a lousy lover, and it's a worse God. Solomon says, those who trust, those who trust, those who put their faith in, those who rely upon their wealth will fall. Not those who have wealth, not those who have money, those who trust in it, those who rely upon it will fall. But the righteous will th thrive like a green leaf. Right? Money is a rival to God. And what you're going to see as we continue on through these passages is every time there's a call to trust in God uh, with our money, there's also a promise of blessing in that reliance. It's a lousy lover. It's a worse God. But it matters. And it matters because it is a powerful, powerful tool. See, every good gift that we've received from God can become an idol. Every good gift that, we, that God has blessed us with in all of creation is something that we can take and, be, and allow to become a violation of God's first commandment to love him, to, to not worship any other gods. And money is just one of the chief examples of how that plays out. Money is a powerful tool. And it does matter because money is a means by which, a resource through which God has blessed us so that we can worship him. Proverbs chapter 9, or Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, then your barns, again, right? Do this, and then he says, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor, worship God with the, thing, the, the, the resources that he has entrusted to you. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the story, the first murder, Cable and Ain, Cain and Abel, that, uh, yeah, Cain and Abel, right? was over what they brought in honor to the Lord. That when, and the, the, the Old Testament precedent goes all the way back to, to Genesis. 
is that is bringing our best, is bringing our first fruits, is honoring God. What you see as you read on to the to the Old Testament is the 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 um, the first fruits is, is, the, is a tenth of the harvest or the best of your flocks. At the, it's where we get the, the idea or the concept of the tithe. And, and tithe means tenth, 10%. Bringing the top of what God has entrusted you honors him. Because you're saying, I trust you more than this gift that you have entrusted to me. And in doing that, we honor God with our wealth. Money is a powerful tool. Because God uses it to support the work that he's doing in the world. And again, this goes back to being, if you look at how God provided for the priesthood, his leaders that were the, 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 the people who represented God to the people and the people to God, the, the people who stood in the gap, the priest, were supported by the tithe of the people. That God uses their, used their resources to provide for the needs who are delivering his work. That if you go forward into even Jesus' ministry, right? Jesus was God's son. He comes to earth. But he didn't just go through earth with God passing everything down to do the work that he did. It actually filtered it through the people that Jesus did life together with. Look at chapter, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and, and you see the story of, and there's a whole group of women. And it says in this passage, in verse 3, that God, that, that, Jesus, that Jesus' ministry was supported out of these women's own means. And you see that same pattern going forward in, in the New Testament. In Paul's ministry, in Philippians chapter 4, the Philippian church supported not just the work that he, was, that he did in Philippi, that the work that he did on mission throughout the region, even onto Rome. The pattern continues today, right? The church, the church, according to the scripture, is... The body of Christ, filled by the Spirit of God, and is literally his ongoing presence in the world today. That the church, by God's design and, and Jesus' call and commission, is continuing to be Christ in the world. And the the flow of how God continues to carry out his work is the same. It's his people contributing their first fruits to accomplish his purposes. Now, we say all the time, and it's absolutely true, God does not need your money or my money. But this is also true. There's very little that he does in the world without it. Money is a powerful tool, as a motivator to use our God-given gifts and exercise our God-given responsibilities. You were created, we were created in the image and likeness of God. And we were created in his image and likeness and given the assignment to rule over and subdue, to study, to take care of the earth. And in essence, God says, I'm, I'm the, the, the creator, the ruler, and I'm putting you in charge according to my design and according to my created order. I'm putting you in charge, and I'm making you responsible for your slice of the world that I'm entrusting to you. You're responsible for it. Like, God is capital K king, and you are little K king and queens of the earth. And with that responsibility comes a call to rule over it, to be the kings and queens of it. And with that responsibility comes a responsibility for our lives and for our kingdom. Paul says, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Settle down and work to earn your own living. 
Paul uses the word, carry your load. And money drives us, motivates us by our need to eat, to use, to go out and to do the things that we can do, to, to use our gifts and our abilities to provide for our legitimate needs. Those needs include and responsibilities include our family. Anyone, Paul says, who neglects to care for family members in need denies the faith. That's worse than refusing to believe in the first place. You are responsible for yourself. You are responsible for your family, and God is entrusting you with the resources, and you're responsible to use those, your gifts, to, to receive them and to use them according to his design. It includes preparing for the future. Right? There is no scriptural admonition against a rainy day fund, against savings. It actually encourages it. The wise store up choice food and, and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Fools eat it all up, use it all up without saving anything for the rainy days that's to come. There's... Uh, the, a biblical principle in, um, in Ephesians chapter 6 that, that I think is really, really helpful for us in understanding our responsibility. Paul says that each of us are to carry our own load. To, to carry our own load, to, to, to take responsibility for the things that we need to make it through our lives and for the people that we're responsible for, to carry our own load. And then he also acknowledges that, hey, there's a lot going on in our lives. There's a lot going on in the world. And, and some of those things that are going on are more than any of us can handle alone. He doesn't deny the fact that, hey, sometimes we're going to need help from other people, and some people are going to need our help. He says, carry your own load. But he says, for those things that are beyond what any one person can do or what an individual who has special challenges can do, or is, he, says, beyond, he says, share your burdens. Share your burdens. And the, and the money that God entrusts to us is a powerful tool because it allows us and motivates to us to use our gifts and our responsibilities, both to meet our own needs, but also to help those who are in need, those who have burdens that are beyond the load that they can carry. We're called to help those in need and resource to do it. Proverbs chapter 19, Solomon says, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord. It's the same idea that Jesus picks up in Matthew 25. If you give a cup of water to someone who is thirsty, you have done it for me. If you give food to someone who is hungry, you have done it for me. If you give to the poor, you are lending to the Lord. And again, there's a promise, and he will rep repay you. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So I'm going to three, three principles, just in kind of taking all this information and applying it to our lives, that we are caretakers, not title holders that we are stewards, that we are not owners. Paul says to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment who richly provides us with everything we need. Continuing. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up, here we go, right? they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation. They're laying and putting an anchor in heaven as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life 
that is truly life. Put your anchor in heaven, and you can take hold of this passage through this perilous journey that we're on. While it might be better to give than to receive, the Bible says we don't have anything to give that we haven't received. We are caretakers, not title holders. Money is the means by which we secure our provisions. Whose money determines who is God? Whose money it is determines who is God in our lives. If it's my money, then I'm taking care of myself. I'm providing for my own needs. I am my own provider. But if it's God's money, if every good gift that I have and every ability that I have to make a living comes to me from him, if it's his then he is supplying for all of my needs, even though I'm taking, earning the money with the gifts that he's given me, going out, making the money, going out and buying the stuff and bringing it home and eating it. It still comes to us from him. And if it's God's money and we spend it on our terms, the prophet Malachi says we're robbing God. We're stealing from the Almighty. We are caretakers not title holders. Second principle, we are farmers, not framers. We are farmers, not framers. Jesus told a parable about a man who had a bumper crop, had more crop that he had room to put in his barn, so he says, I have this great plan. I'm going to tear down all the barns that I have. I'm going to build builder barns, and then I can put all the store, all my crops in these bigger barns, and I can kick back and relax and enjoy the rest of my life. And in Jesus' parable, he says, the guy's a fool, and that night he dies. And he's got all his barns full of all these crops, but nothing to do with it. Because his ticket was punched. He says, don't be framers, don't be barn builders, farmers. Remember those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You have seed, and you put a little seed in the ground, you're going to get a little crop. You have seeds, and you put a lot of seeds in the ground you're going to get a much bigger crop. Sow sparingly. Reap sparingly. You're a farmer, not a farmer. You're a farmer, not a framer. Paul continues, now he who supplies seed to the sower, right? It's not ours. He gives it to us to do something with it. And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness, you will be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. The generosity puts us in the supply line of God's economy. The generosity puts us in the supply line of God's blessings. The reward of a faithful steward is not, look what I have, look what I've earned, now what can I do with all the things that I have earned? It's not entitlement. The reward of a faithful steward is greater opportunity to serve, greater opportunity to give. You will be enriched in every way as you sow generously, you will be rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. From the, from the beginning of God's call on Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless all the nations. That are, I'm going to bless you, and you will be a blessing. I'm going to bless you. Not so that you can say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Look how blessed I am. I'm going to bless you so that you can bless other people. Third, the faithful servant. The faithful servant becomes a faithful follower. 
right? Every one of these passages you read talks about us being faithful to God's word, to God's promise, to God's calling, to God's design. Be faithful. And as we're faithful, we see God fulfilling his promises and we, became, we become faithful. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, Malachi said. So there will be enough for my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing to, to, so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. But what we find is here, we don't know until we trust. And we don't really trust until we try. But as we try, and as we trust, and as we see God move in our lives, now we have dropped an anchor in heaven that is pulling us through. We set our hearts on a pilgrimage. And who thought that that pilgrimage was going to come to, hey, invest wisely. Invest wisely. I asked um, one of our uh, church members, Catherine, to share uh, her story of how this played out for her. So we're going to uh, video. Uh, this is Catherine Santani, a member of our church family here at The Journey. Hi, Journey family. I want to share my experience with tithing. I run a daycare for my home, and my income fluctuates from time to time. I use credit cards when I couldn't afford things, and I found myself with quite a bit of debt. Our church offered a class on financial peace, and I was reminded that God asked us to tithe. It didn't make sense to give 10% of my earnings when I had this much credit card debt. I would try to make deals with God. If he would just help me get out of debt, then I would tithe each week. The church needs our money, but God doesn't. God needs us to trust him. So I decided it wasn't working my way, so I would put my finances in God's hands. Each week, I tithed, I gave 10%. Some weeks it wasn't very much, and some weeks it seemed like a lot of money that I could use to pay down my credit card debt, but I prayed and I gave. Then one day, my daughter needed a $1,600 dental procedure. That morning I got up and I prayed. I was gonna have to add it to my credit card debt, but I told God that I trust him and that I would continue to tithe. Later that day when I was working, my ex-husband called very upset. He had to pay $1,500 in back child support. He was so shocked because I was so excited. I told him it was a miracle. I had asked God and he had provided. Someone said to me, too bad you had that dental bill and you couldn't just keep the extra money. But I said, then I wouldn't have seen where God was working in my life. That was the last time I ever questioned God about money. Since then, I've, had, I've been blessed with a prosperous daycare and I've gotten myself out of debt. I can't explain it except to say that I trusted God. So my advice to you is to give first and live blessed. A faithful servant becomes a faithful follower. And we have set our hearts on a pilgrimage till each of us appears before God and Zion. And God has given us an anchor that we can drop in heaven that will allow us, that will pull us safely through the heartaches and the heartbreaks and the struggles and the challenges of, world, of the world. Because God is a good God. Because God is a faithful God. Because God is a loving God, but our money is a lousy lover, and it's a worthless God. Lord, in your divine wisdom, thank you for your economy. Thank you that you have blessed us um, so generously and so abundantly with all of creation and all the wonders with our gifts and our abilities that you have entrusted to us, and that you invite us into to participate in the supply line of your blessings to support the work of your, of your kingdom in the world through the church to 
participate in the caring of others and sharing burdens and the honor and the blessing of that for the, the blessing of trusting and experiencing your faithfulness that deepens our faith, that strengthens our confidence in you, that increases our heart, our passion as worshipers. Lord, help us take the first step and the next step, trusting that as we are faithful, that you will provide that we might be generous on every occasion. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I do want to remind you, uh, if you uh, didn't see the announcements, or just to reiterate, um, on Easter Sunday, two weeks from today, Easter Sunday, we are going to have a live worship service here at The Journey. We're going to do that worship service in the parking lot, and I uh, would love to see you here. Also understand that not everyone's able to come out, not ready to come out and be in a public setting, so we will also have a, a live stream service on, uh, on Easter morning. So both will be available, but, but would love those who are vaccinated or comfortable. We will be social distance, we'll be masking, we'll do an all, all, following all the protocols on that day. But if you're able to come and worship together with us, we will do a Good Friday service. We're gonna do that on Zoom instead of Facebook. And we're doing it on Zoom because Zoom allows everybody to be on the screen together and um, a little bit more of an interactive experience that I think will serve our Good Friday service um, really, really well. And uh, we'll provide the link for you. Um, we'll have it next Sunday in church. We'll also be sending it out in an email. Um, it'll be on our church, web already is on our church website. So join us on Zoom on Good Friday and tentatively, Tentatively, if things continue to move in the direction that they are right now and the numbers are good, um, things hold. The Sunday after Easter, April 11, we're going to begin live, in-person, indoor worship um, in our sanctuary, social distance, masked, all safety protocols. Tentative at this point, but we're hopeful that by the Sunday after Easter that we can be together in the sanctuary for those who are able to. So I just want to share those things with you. Continue to pray for the church as, as a body, as a community of faith, and for those who are part of our community and those who are beyond our community um, in this season. Let's love one another, serve one another, bless one another, pray for one another well. Thank you. I'm going to give it to our worship team for our closing song. How sweet did you gaze on my perilous heart to be friends to my bitter end and carry the burden for his grave and my failure you prevailed in pure love to be found in the depths of your heart as good as forgiven. Oh, how you graced that cross when Jesus died and death took the loss. Wild as the flood, gates of heaven flung wide open within. Scars. Now mine is a life you raised. Yours the glory that took down that grave. Bright as the sun, almighty in love. God, forever your kingdom come. Oh, how sweet is the sound. Of a heart drenched in grace Rising up from the ashes in praise A 
alive to your greatness. Hope is praise and is mercy through the terrible night. How you blaze through the darkness I find right as the morning. the glory that took down that grave bright as the sun almighty in love and God forever your kingdom come my heart burns wild in my chest in all of your heart in all that you are let your praise run all of your heart I'll sing it again now my heart burns wild in my chest in all of your heart in all that you are let your praise run wild in my chest in all of your heart I'll sing it again till my heart out of my chest I'll sing of your love in all of your heart till your praise is all I have left I'll sing of your love again and again till my heart beats out of my chest I'll sing of your love in all of your heart till your praise is all I have left. I'll sing of your love again and again. I forgot to say it. Um, thank you to Catherine uh, for sharing her testimony of, um, of her faithfulness and God's faithful response to her and, and God's um, sense of humor. How else can you say it? Um, he's really cool that way. And uh, so just really appreciate her sharing her story this morning. And I hope you were blessed and encouraged by that as well. Go with God's grace. Walk and live in love and the power of his spirit. Go in peace, but not to pieces. Amen. Amen.